In February of 2010, a webinar was presented on learning in 3D by Carl Kopp and Tony O'Driscoll. Dan Blyton and Charles Gluck facilitated the webinar. In this excerpt of the presentation, Carl is discussing 14 archetypes that describe how people learn in 3D virtual worlds. Uh, the first time I was ever in a 3D experience, I was learning English as a second language, which was weird for me, one, because English is my first and only language, and second, I was in this 3D world. I went in then to a virtual classroom, sat in a virtual seat, had a virtual instructor, and they put up virtual PowerPoint slides, which um, I thought was absolutely the worst use of 3D learning, because why didn't you put me in a restaurant or have me order uh, um, a bus ticket or in an airport or something that immersed me in the environment. So we developed uh, about 14 archetypes which describe how people learn best in these environments. And I'm going to uh, go through these and kind of uh, show you what the um, environments look like. So the first is a guided tour. And a guided tour is basically where somebody leads somebody else through an environment. So it could be an environment such as a battlefield. It could be an environment such as a town that they've never been into. It could be used for reconnaissance. Imagine taking something like Google Maps, making it into 3D, becoming an avatar, and walking from building to building to find out where the alcoves are or find out where the potential blind spots are. So if somebody could walk you through that who might have been to that town before. That's a guided tour. And it doesn't have to be actually a physical person. If you go to virtual Morocco, for example, they have something called an info fez, which basically is a fez that you put on your head. And as you get near certain objects, it gives you information. Another item would be, of course, a scavenger hunt. Uh, again, good for new employee orientation, good for allowing somebody to understand an environment by asking them to look for certain things. So imagine if you're in a factory and you say, okay, I want you to find all the safety violations. And so you would go on a scavenger hunt looking for safety violations or trying to find out where problems were occurring. So that would be another way of implementing a scavenger hunt. A group forum, when I first was in a sec uh, 3D virtual world, I said, you know, no group get-togethers, no kind of mass um, audiences. It should be one-on-one. -on -one, it should be immersive. But I found out through the years of teaching in this environment that you need times to have virtual groups get together, especially for um, pre-briefings on what to do in the virtual learning situation, as well as reflective learning when you're done with the event to reflect upon what happened and um, what experiences people encountered. Another is uh, what we call conceptual orienteering. And that's orienting somebody to a concept. So let's say you're trying to teach the concept of something like a tsunami. Well, you couldn't actually go to the beach, stand on the beach, and wait for a tsunami to hit. You could certainly see pictures of it or you could read about it, but it wouldn't be the same as really experiencing the concept. And so conceptual orienteering is the idea that in a 3D virtual world, we can experience concepts that we couldn't experience otherwise, even in the physical world. The other uh, example here is operational uh, application. And what that is, is it's your traditional simulation where you're actually operating a piece of equipment or a piece of machinery in a virtual 3D environment. And the thing about this is you now are operating this in conjunction with someone else. So you're not operating the simulation by yourself. You've got to pay attention to other people. Um, for example, we're going to give a, a case study later on that talks about training helicopter pilots. And um, they're working on some artificial intelligence in a virtual 3D world where you're working as an individual learning to fly the helicopter with two other individuals. And all the other environment might be uh, artificial intelligence behaving as your adversary would behave, and you're learning to operate the helicopter, and they're operating the tanks, and working all together from that type of environment. And here is an inside of a helicopter to illustrate that point. Another one is that um, role plays become really critical in this type of environment. We talked about it before, but think of how a traditional role play occurs in a classroom. Two people get up in front of the classroom and you know, they're not dressed apart, they're not in the right context, they're not in the right environment, there's no visual cues, no auditory cues, and they kind of just go through the motions. 
in a virtual 3D environment, we can put people into the environment in which the behavior is to occur. When we do that, what that does is provides the cognitive cues for the person to recall it when they're actually in that situation. And we know that people um, are more easily or more readily recall uh, cues when they learn in a situation similar to the one in which they have to perform the activity. And that's really a big um, advantage of role plays. And, And Ken Hudson, for example, does role plays for Border Patrol officers. And he said as soon as the student in the virtual world puts on the Border Patrol uniform, they become a Border Patrol person. They assume the persona. And that's why in the physical world we wear uniforms, because it puts you in a certain mindset. The same thing happens in the virtual world. Critical incident. So critical incident is where you would fight a fire as a team, where you would work together. We're going to do an example later on um, that Marilyn did uh, to teach first responders how to respond to uh, car accidents. Um, And that's a really good way of getting a team to work together under stress to solve problems. And of course, you've got to have breakout sessions. Uh, breakout sessions are really important. Breakout sessions uh, are where informal learning occurs. I know one uh, organization that they have an informal learning room physically, and after class, they go up into this room and has a fireplace and couches, and they say, you know, some of the most effective learning occurs in that situation. Well, here in a virtual world, you can go to a virtual garden, you could hang out and discuss items and a breakout session very comfortably, and that's when a lot of learning occurs. It's kind of the the around-the-water cooler learning. And, of course, social networking. And if you think about leading a virtual team all around the world and getting to know your virtual teammates, you know, getting together for a conference call once a week is not going to give you a whole lot of personality or idea about those folks. But if they each had a virtual office that they could decorate and you can meet in different virtual offices or you can meet in virtual locations or even meet in a replica of your client's manufacturing facility, that gives you a completely different perspective than uh, being on a conference call with uh, your typical distractions. And uh, data visualization. And what data visualization allows you to do is it allows us to take data and sensors from actual machinery and put them into a 3D world to monitor them, to make changes to them, and to observe what happens. So, for example, this is an actual windmill that's connected to real sensors. And so you can see real-time the wind speed that is occurring within uh, the physical environment and then being recorded back into the virtual environment. So imagine, if you will, if I had an entire screen fill of these windmills, and they can be in different locations, but I can view them all from one location, and when one turns yellow, I know that there's a problem. So it allows me quick data visualization from the 3D world. Here, for example, on the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Association island in Second Life, they actually take real-time weather data and put it into a weather map that you can walk around. Now, imagine you're a customer service representative, and now you have to go out in a snowstorm, and you have to deal with somebody's uh, breakdown at their company or whatever. You could mimic that type of environment in a virtual world and anticipate maybe what kind of equipment you would need, what kind of obstacles you would encounter, what your time frame was. You could walk through the scenario before actually going to the customer site, reducing your time on site possibly, and reducing customers' downtime. So that gives you a sense of how you could use data visualization. And you could also look for trends and those types of things. So we put those things together, and that gives us the 3D learning archetypes. And each of those archetypes go into what we call macro structures. This is kind of the the academic aspect of our model. But basically, these kind of uh, go into agency, exploration, connectedness, and experience. And by looking at these together, you can create an effective 3D learning solution that doesn't involve virtual PowerPoint. And that's really um, one of the things that we want to make sure that, that people understand. This book is a must-have for any instructional designer seeking to integrate virtual worlds into their training.